So our next panel is dealing with short-term short loans. And you know, the, the, certainly there are some, some different challenges in, this, uh, in that product. So what I'm going to do, Brendan Ross is going to be the moderator of this panel. Uh, I've known Brendan for quite, a, quite some time. He runs the Direct Lending Investments. Um, it's, a, it's his company, which he will tell you about, I'm sure. It's, um, it, it invests in small business loans, in high yield small business loans. So I would like to bring up Brendan and the next panel. Thank you. I will get started. Uh, as Peter mentioned, uh, Brendan Ross run Direct Lending Investments. We're the general partner of a fund that makes short-term, high-yield small business loans. My buy box to date has been six to 18-month loans that repay either daily or weekly. So that's my area of expertise. <laughs> I've also been an investor for some time in various peer-to-peer -peer funds. I was an early investor in the Lending Club broad-based fund and in others as well. I've, I've been in this space for a little while. We're in the middle of a long-term secular change in the way banking is done in this country. And the clearest way for me to explain it is that banks have really gone from being community-focused to being Fed-focused. And the distraction of regulatory pressure uh, has really created a situation in which loans have significantly declined to community members, especially small businesses. So when I lead off my sales pitch for my fund, I talk about how small businesses significantly overpay for credit. And the reason that they do so is because of this decline. In 1998, small businesses, loans to small businesses, loans of under $1 million, represented about a half of all bank loans once you threw out farm and residential loans. Today, that stands at about 28%. There has never been a year during that entire period when bank loans to small businesses didn't retreat. That's a really significant change. That's a 40% decline in those types of loans. And the result of that has been two types of borrowers that overpay for credit. The first, of course, is small business and business owners. Let's do a little audience participation. Do we have any dentists in the audience? Any dentists? We're light on dentists, I think. Do we have anyone who, is, who works for a consumer lending company that has loaned consumer money, made a consumer loan to a dentist, uh, or suspects that they have, uh, as a personal loan? I'm, I'm positive there need to be some hands. Perfect. C can I ask you, uh, what would a consumer pay, um, what, would a, what would a dentist pay on a platform if they were an A or a B borrower? Somewhere in the 8% to 10% range. These are great borrowers, right? A dentist buying, making a loan, a short-term business loan, and I've made dozens of loans to dentists, for their dental practice, not their personal, but their dental practice will pay 25 to 35%. That's a normal rate of interest for a dentist to pay. That gives you a sense of the dislocation in this country between our capability of loaning money to consumers and our capability of loaning money to those same types of people who happen to be entrepreneurs and have started their business instead of being employees. And it's really profound. I mentioned that there were two groups that overpay for credit. The second group are businesses that lend money to small businesses, like these folks here. And um, the solution to that has actually come in many ways from folks like myself and others in this room that are part of the transition from, platform, from spread lending to platform lending. So spread lenders are those that make money with their equity and then they lever that equity. And I think one of the challenges is the tailwind created by the absence of bank lending from small businesses has created a tremendous opportunity for, for existing spread lenders to transition towards platform <laughs> lending, towards concentrating their equity and focusing their CEO and CFO energies on finding more borrowers, getting off the raise money, lever it, raise money, lever it treadmill, and focusing instead on selling loans to folks like myself. So with that as an introduction, I wanted to ask the folks on my panel to introduce themselves and also if they could to talk a little bit about the types of loans that they make, sense of the volume, and how they see that changing in the future. I can go first. Um, am I on? Uh, hi, my name is Rob Froan. I'm with Cabbage. Uh, myself and Catherine Petrelia, sitting right over there, started the company back in 2009. We provide uh, working capital to small businesses. Uh, we do it through a highly automated uh, system that allows us to pull in data on each of these small businesses 
Uh, they electronically uh, connect us to these data sources, and we're able to underwrite them, provide them capital immediately. Um, we started the company in 09, but we really didn't start putting out cash until 2011, and that's because we were committed to building an automated system. Uh, pretty much everybody else in the space, the year they started is the year they started putting out cash, and that's because they were able to do that without investing in a platform, but that was very, very important for us. So in the last three years, since we started putting out cash in, in any sort of quantity, uh, we put out uh, over $250 million. We'll cross the $500 million barrier a little later this year, and within a year, about a year and a, a month or so, we'll cross a uh, billion dollars of capital out. So that'll be four years from zero to a billion dollars, which will make us the fastest uh, small business lender to ever do that. Um, Brendan? Hi, I'm Brendan Carroll. I'm a partner at Victory Park Capital. We are an asset management firm uh, focused on a lot of different sectors, but one of our main focuses is on the, is on the specialty finance world where we will provide capital to companies like Cabbage and others that are both in the merchant cash space, consumer lending, basically anything that a bank won't lend to. So I guess technically I'm the guy you're saying everybody's overpaying to. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, that, that's who we are. But we've done in the last four years, we've committed and invested over a billion and a half dollars uh, across the sector. You know, we usually get involved before those platforms become large enough where they can attract more institutional capital. Uh, but we've been very involved since 2007, 2008 in the space. Uh, back when they still referred to it as peer to peer, we knew it was going to be peer to an institution. So uh, we tried to step up and get involved very early. Um, but we're big, we're very bullish on the sector, but again, we'll play across all facets of it. Great. Uh, James Mendelson from Can Capital. Uh, we just crossed uh, last month the four billion mark in our total transaction value in both uh, uh, loans and uh, merchant cash advances that we facilitated, really across the spectrum of both types of businesses. Um, and I think our future growth is going to come from uh, where our uh, historical growth has been, which is uh, across a broad swath of industries, uh, being able to serve businesses in the channels they choose, whether in a, a fully automated way or a, a customer-assisted way. Um, but we're continuing to see, obviously, a great demand for the, the set of products uh, from the space. Um, and. Um, that's uh, uh, so just more of the same to come. Great. Yeah, hi, hey, Steve Scheinbaum with Merchant Cash and Capital. Um, I started the business back in 2005. Um, we have financed approximately 30,000 transactions um, for about $650, $670 million on our own balance sheet. Um, over the last year or so, we started participating or selling some interests in deals, which have accounted for about another 180 million or so, so we've done around 850 million. Um, typical loan size is $40,000. Um, term, three to 15 months, we go with an average cost of about 1.34. Um, like Rob and, and, um, and, and James, we are a tremendous emphasis on technology, really trying to use it you know, in, in two ways, to increase the user experience and the customer experience by being able to leverage technology and gather the information we need to really underwrite the deal well and keep our collection rates high from third parties, you know, as, as, as well as just make the whole process much more efficient and streamlined. Okay, great. Um, we've seen a lot of technological advances and a lot of tools and a lot of improvements in the tools that are used by online underwriters, especially small business lenders that digest so much information from such a variety of sources. And I was wondering to what extent you see and make an explicit trade-off between the level of automation that you have and the amount of bad debt that you see and the amount of bad debt that you'd like to see. Um, we could go in maybe reverse order. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I, we have not actually seen any trade-off with respect to getting, automating, the, automating the business more and, um, and corresponding charge-offs. You know, we still we use technology as much as we can firm believers of it, but we still, we still speak with every merchant. We still speak with critical vendors. We're still communicating with many landlords, you know, and especially more so on, on the longer term deals. But we actually think the ability to use technology and gather, you know, social information and a lot of the other information that's out there alleviates fraud, gives us some more third party verification. And we've actually seen collection rates improve with the enhancement of technology. 
Yeah, I would agree with that. I, and I think that the, uh, the trade-off that you're uh, uh, premising, right, between automation and, and bad debt uh, isn't necessarily that clean. I mean, I think we, we have the ability to see uh, through both testing and uh, an understanding of our portfolio, you know, where those puts and takes are. I think from our standpoint, the, the benefit of automation is being able to provide a better experience to the customer, provide them a better set of options, um, and then work through uh, the, the process with them and, and give them those choices. Um, so if a customer gets to the end of a process and, uh, for example, doesn't want to um, electronically sign documents and they would, would rather have a person facilitate that for them over the phone, that's a terrific choice, but that's not necessarily a trade-off um, you know, between uh, an automated process and, uh, and a write-off. For us, we're one level removed because we're providing that capital to the platform that's then lending it out to the customer. but. You know, over the last few years, as it has become more increasingly automated, you know, we've seen default rates come down. You know, we're checking it typically on a 30-day look-back basis, and every borrower has a default band that they're operating within to determine how much capital we will then provide uh, every 30-day look-back. And we've seen volumes increase, and we've seen defaults come down, and most of that has to do with the increased automation uh, that we've seen from our portfolio companies. And, and I think, to some extent, the general improvements in the economy, right? So, for example, if you look in my portfolio, you can see over time that the average, um, the average credit score, the average FICO of the personal guarantor has gone up. And I always wonder to what extent that's a result of the improvements in the economy and the distance that those borrowers have put between themselves and whatever bad might have happened. So I think there's some impact on that. In terms of us for automation, um, you know, I think you have to look at a few things. It's not a trade-off. Because you're automated, you suddenly see necessarily a much higher uh, delinquency and charge-off rate. Um, it's what the level of automation does to the other key metrics within the business. So if you're running a business like ours, there's a few key things to look at. There's your cost of acquisition, right? So, and then there's cost of capital, um, your charge-offs. And then there's the cost of your infrastructure, your people, and other, and other items within the, within the organization. If you can be highly automated, and by automation, I'm not necessarily just talking about pulling in data from key data sources. I'm saying having a fully automated process so a customer, <coughs> literally, if they choose not to interact with anybody on our side, they can go through the whole process and get access to a line of credit immediately. What that allows us to do is operate with a much lower infrastructure cost. Um, if you look at us on a comparable basis, we operate with about a third to, to one-fourth of the number of employees that a lot of other folks in this space operate um, comparably with. And what that allows us to do is take that huge cost savings and invest it into other parts of our business. And one way is you can control your bad debt rate, but you can make a proactive decision that you'll take on a little bit more bad debt in order to broaden the market and make capital available to, to more small businesses. And that's the conscious decision we've been able to make by having a real focus on, focus on automation. That's great. When I first invested in, in Lending Club and Prosper Notes in early 2011, I definitely have noticed since then that there's been some yield compression. And I think it's been partly a function of um, the desire on, on behalf of the platforms to attract more and different borrowers. Uh, and partly also perhaps competitive pressure. One of the things that's been interesting about business lending is I haven't really seen the yield compression at all. And in fact, in conversations I've had with the CEOs who sell loans to me, I've encouraged them to experiment with the elasticity of demand based on increases in prices. Uh, one of the things that I'm wondering what the, that I'd like to hear the panel perspective on is why that yield compression hasn't taken place in small business loans and why has there been that resiliency? Uh, so, you know, one thing is it, it's actually a small business loan is sort of like shopping for a mattress. Um, you can't really compare one mattress to the other one, and I think it's, I think it's true in our space as well. So what we, what we try to do is we try to have as much transparency and allow folks to have sliders and rulers. They can figure out what the total cost to them is. Um, but I think there's just a lack of transparency. There's a lack of a central place where they can understand what the relative rates um, of the different products that are out there are. Um, and I think it is a challenge for the small business owner. Uh, but they're not necessarily always rate shopping. I mean, one thing that we find 
from our customers is they're looking for different types of things, right? They're looking for how much cash they, they can get on what basis, you know, what's the length or term of that cash that's made available, how fast can they get access to it. I mean, those are all factors that also play into the decision. But ultimately, um, I, you know, I do think that there's been some lack of transparency across the industry and something that we're hopeful will change. We'd like to, we'd like to be behind um, creating more transparency in the industry. I think there's a trade-off to some extent between transparency and shopping time. A lot of business owners are dealing with a situation in which something is broken and needs fixing, and those people need money quickly um, at the same time as they're recovering from whatever it is that's broken. Let's get some more perspectives. I mean, I'm a bit of a cynic. Um, hopefully there's nobody from the CFPB in the room. But <laughs> small business loans in many cases, you know, it could be viewed as an individual or a family-run business where, from a regulation standpoint, the government doesn't have the same scrutiny on this sector as it does on the consumer space, where you've seen a lot of those loans come down. Also, institutional capital will look to provide money to a small business lender before a consumer lender, and I'm making a generalization, because there isn't that same sort of moral hurdle. There isn't that same sort of regulatory risk involved. So they have, it's a supply-demand imbalance right now. And there, you don't need to lower those rates. Yes, you can have larger loans with lower rates to healthier companies, but for the most part, you don't have that same pressure, in my opinion, from the government uh, on this sector that you do in the consumer sector. So not that it's the Wild West and people are running wild, but there is less scrutiny, which allows you, there's no reason to lower the prices. So you're, so you're saying, in a sense, that both types of borrowers, consumer and business, are, are opportunistic in the sense that a consumer might open a piece of mail and choose to send in that $35,000 check, or a business might get that same piece of mail or a phone call from their, from their, you know, from their ISO. Um, and it's really, and the, the lack of rate pressure is really just a function of the tailwind that I described earlier, the absence of banks and small business lending. Uh, yes, and, and, I mean, it's, it's a generalization, but yes, for the most part, for those truly small businesses where it's a single owner or a small family run business that doesn't have that infrastructure to be able to go out and go to a local or regional bank to do it, a lot of times it's, it's you know, the, not the lender of last resort, but time is of the essence, they need that capital quickly and they'll go with who's gotten to them. And, and I think this is a point worth highlighting. The, the average SBA loan in 2012 was $337,000. The average loan in my portfolio is 41000 And I think that's probably relatively similar with uh, some of the folks across the stage here. So there's really a distinction between small businesses, which do have outlets among traditional financers, and neighborhood businesses who really fall in the hole between consumer loans evaluated with W-2s and bank loans evaluated with income statements and balance sheets. Let's, let's continue to talk about yield. Well, I think, I mean, you make a good point about the trade-off uh, between speed and, uh, and cost for some businesses in some cases. Um, I will say that we are really very actively testing uh, lower prices, um, the same sort of uh, price testing that you've seen in, in consumer. Um, but the market splits, and there are some businesses that are price conscious. There are other businesses that are much more line sensitive uh, or payment sensitive. So we want to make sure that we're serving the whole spectrum in, in the best way possible. Uh, and providing those choices to the businesses to be able to sort of self-sort into the right product that they, that they want for whatever issue it is that they're facing. Um, and I think the, you know, the absence of sort of bank equivalent rates and bank equivalent products uh, is something that I, I think the sector can, uh, can fill. Uh, with the, the right approaches, um, but still being sensitive to the fact that when a small business encounters this uh, an issue where there is a, a need uh, for working capital or a short-term product, speed is usually going to trump uh, a lot of other considerations. Great. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I think there are a variety of factors. I look back um, historically, I saw um, at our business, we saw most margin compression I'd say in, two th in early 2009 and maybe 2010 when I think that when um, right after, right after the, li the liquidity crisis, there was, there was so much demand for our product from borrowers or customers that folks in our space could never access before that the well-financed you know, small business lenders, alternative finance companies, cash advance providers were creating these lower cost products 
to go attract that to go attract that better credit. And there was a t and, and there was a good amount of margin compression then. Since then, we haven't seen much margin compression. Instead, I think we've seen a real elongation of the programs. And, and many of our business and, and many of our customers seem to be, you know, primarily concerned with how much capital they can access and how much. Um, they're going to have to repay on a monthly basis, you know, and how severely or minimally their cash flow is going to be Im impeded or impacted during it as, a, as opposed to just the flat out yield. You know, I think we're fortunate to have two folks on the panel um, who have lent through the Great Recession uh, and uh, in the case of CAN even further back uh, because you guys began as Advanced Me, I think, in the late 90s, right? Could you guys talk a little bit about the resiliency of small businesses during recessions and what you've seen and what your experiences have been from a yield and a default perspective during those downturns? Um, sure. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, in a full disclosure way, I've only, I, I haven't uh, personally been with, uh, uh, with CAN through the recessions, but I think uh, the learning that we were able to generate uh, through, uh, through three credit cycles is actually quite important, both about how businesses perform um, and, and both uh, as sort of those who are seeking products uh, and, and solutions um, and the actual uh, remit and delinquency performance of the portfolio. Um, and so as you see, the, the ability to capture that has actually been quite important, where we are able to add that perspective um, to our current underwriting and our current view of the portfolio, um, both as to the businesses that we seek to target uh, and, 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 and acquire as, as customers uh, and in the ongoing management of the portfolio. Um, so I think that's, the, that's been the cumulative impact. Um, but I, I, I can't talk to the actual specifics. Steve, yeah, please. I, I, I echo most of what James said, but um, we were there before and, and I, I lived through those, the, those, scary, uh, the, those scary several months or quarters. But um, you know, before before um, before the crisis, I'd say you know our average our average credit score was probably fifty or sixty points less than it is now. You know, we were dealing with a substantially weaker customer. Um, you know, we had a six month program with a one three with you know with a one three zero factor rate, and we were collecting eighty seven percent of the of the RTR. We we were lucky, or through a lot of hard work, we saw a lot of the down cycle coming. So we really tightened 2008, 2009 were really very positively differentiating times for us. Our collection rates increased to 91, 92%, and they've remained there or gone upward ever since. We have a, we have a better customer, but I think in terms of dealing with, in terms of dealing with the, with, with the consumer, with the small business and, and in a recessionary time, a lot of it is just really studying data, understanding where you wanna be and not wanna be, not getting too far levered you know, with the customers and making sure that you're not taking so much of their revenue that they're not going to be able to weather some seasonality or cyclicality or something like that. And we put a lot of time into that. Yeah, I think, I think one of the things that's been interesting for me as I've constructed my portfolio is that I've been looking explicitly at and being asked to explain to investors, you know, what will happen during a downturn, what will happen if there's a repeat of the Great Recession. One of the interesting things that you can see in Federal Reserve data on credit card loans is you can see a default rate of about 4% as a baseline default rate on credit card loans. Uh, and then you can see that peaking, the non seasonally adjusted charge-offs peaking at around 10.5%, 10.9% during the recession before dropping back down. So that's an increase in defaults of about 2.5x. And um, my portfolio where I have about a 6% default rate uh, we have about, we could withstand about a 22% default rate before having negative returns. So I think one of the things that's terrific about small business loans from an investor's perspective is the extent to which they can withstand substantial default rates because the borrowers so significantly overpay for credit. That's what attracted me to the space. Um, how do you guys currently fund your loans and how do you see that changing in the future? So uh, for a long time, we worked with this guy right here. Um, and by the way, you know, one of the things, when you're a young company, much like you were talking about, you know, paying higher rates, uh, when you're a young company, you know, one of the important things is getting a facility, substantial facility, and dealing with folks that, I'm not just 
kissing his ass or anything. But working with Victory Park was great because they were willing to come in when we're at a very young cycle in our business and support us. Uh, we recently moved into, we, we announced about a month ago, closed about six weeks ago, uh, the first um, securitization, I think I've heard that somewhere before, but ours I think was the first. First securitization, $270 million securitization placed through Guggenheim Securities. Um, now that, that's one facility that we're using, but we're also working with uh, a few other folks on developing other portfolios. So we fund it through, uh, through, uh, through a securitization and we'll continue to work with a variety of partners um, on different funding vehicles going forward. Originally it was all our equity and then it was partners uh, like Victory Park and, and it's moved into, uh, into this type of institutional funding. And so if you were to get 10 times as big as you are today, where would you imagine your funding would come from? Um, I, I, I sort of believe in a diversification of sources. So um, we're definitely moving in the realm of, I think we can increase what we're doing with folks like Guggenheim. I think we can bring in facilities um, such as working with folks like Victory Park on different portfolios we're creating. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity for, for retail, for P2P in this space. I think you need to have a diversification just to take into account the uh, economic life cycle. So going forward, we're gonna be looking at, at all options and making sure that those are all available to us institutional capital doesn't want to get involved, the investment banks don't want to get involved, it's too small, it hasn't scaled, and still for a lot of the traditional capital out there, there's that moral hurdle, you know, call it 35, 40% APRs north of that, and again, I'm making a generalization, the banks don't want to be near that yet, they're getting closer and closer to it. So, you know, our type of capital allows that company to grow, but we're very happy that Rob was able to go get a cheaper facility. That's great for all involved. That's why we like to be equity investors in some of these facilities as well. I mean, that, that was the intent, you know. We're sober. He doesn't want to pay me the interest rate he was paying me in perpetuity. We're there to help him get off the ground, and now going forward, there'll be other products and other opportunities that, again, the banks won't touch, so someone like us still needs to be there. Um, but I think one thing that's changed over the years is from the institutional LP or limited partner perspective, they've gotten more comfortable and gotten more knowledge on this sector and on this space. Whereas originally four to five years ago, you mentioned high APR lending, it, it raises some red flags. People don't understand it. They don't, they don't want to be anywhere near it. You know, fortunately over time, as it's become more in the main fray, so to say, people have gotten more comfortable with it, which has been beneficial to us because it allows us to provide larger volumes of capital at lower rates. And, you know, in a one-year amortizing loan, let's take, let's take a loan to our dentist, a $100,000 loan. If that loan is done at a 30% interest rate, because the amortization schedule is so short, the actual amount of interest that that dentist will pay will be about $15,000. So for someone borrowing money at 30%, they generally are thinking about it more in terms of what they're going to end up paying back and how badly and to what extent they need that 100000 and what they might be able to do with it. So it's interesting because as an investor, I'm taking the principal back and redeploying it in loans and buying new loans. As a borrower, borrow 100, pay back 115, that equation to them feels very doable and it's part of what makes the short duration space, I think, attractive. Um, let's, keep, let's keep talking about how we're gonna fund loans in the future. I would love to hear from the two of you on this. Yeah, well, we fund through a syndicate of, of banks. Uh, I think we'll, we'll continue to, to look at the different options uh, that are available um, that give us a, a competitive cost of capital. I think there's, a, there's sort of a, a, a pretty clear relationship between the, the write-off and the performance of the portfolio relative to the cost of capital that we're able to raise. Um, but uh, that's been our ability to grow uh, has been based on that, uh, that syndicate. Yeah, I think we've traditionally um, also grown our business with a tradition with a traditional balance sheet with a with a, with a syndicate of lenders. Um, you know, the, as I mentioned, the last year or so, we've been starting to sell some participations. You know, congratulations to Rob on the securitization. I think all I think all that stuff is great. But um, you know, in 2005, when I started the business in 2007 or 2008, I never imagined a period where my lender would call up and say, "We're out of money. We're done." You know, we, we can't, we, we just can't finance you anymore. So in terms of, and, and to echo Rob's point, in terms of diversification is really, really important to us. So we, we think that securitization is great. We think that selling loans is great. We think that having a balance sheet is great. I mean, there were plenty of folks in the mortgage business who built their entire business 
around a securitization. They had a small warehouse line. They would originate and they would sell off. And then all of a sudden, the securitization markets seized up. They froze and they were out of business, right? So at least at, you know, at MCC, we try to take a conservative approach and, and we want to employ everything we can. But in the event the markets, the securitization market would ever seize or, or you would ever stop buying loans, right? We want to make sure that our business is healthy and able to continue to grow. So we would still want to have that balance sheet and those warehouse lines for ourselves to carry the business for several quarters. You know, it's been interesting because Lending Club and Prosper have put forth a kind of a business hypothesis that the best way to increase equity value for shareholders is to focus on selling loans in a marketplace. And it's been interesting to see, um, and especially because I have these conversations daily with lenders, the difference between the, um, between the comfort that a Lending Club and a Prosper have had with adopting a, a marketplace model that for the most part is pretty consistent uh, versus the many different types of balance sheet options that have been adopted in small business. And I think it's probably mostly a function of the higher yields in small business. So it's a struggle for small business lenders to think through how exactly they want to sell off a loan that if they can underwrite it well, they can make double what can be made on a consumer loan. Yeah. Hey, Peter, Peter? Oh, excuse me, but I think part of, but part of the, it's, it's incredibly capital intense as compared to, you know, in, in, in our space, um, in, in our space, the, the duration of the deals are so, much, are so much shorter, and it turns that you can really fund your own demand for a really long time and hold it on your balance sheet for a substantially longer period, I think, than you could on a consumer side. But I'd be interested in hearing what the other guys have to say. No, I, I echo your comments. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is, you know, it's much shorter. You don't see the ballooning portfolios you see on the consumer side. So, you know, the amount of capital, I think it was brought up on the last panel that, you know, ev you know everybody on the panel represented, you know, less than a half a billion dollars worth of portfolio. And that's the reality uh, in small business short-term lending. I mean, I think as we start moving to, you know, longer-term products, if you can really maintain an understanding of that business over time, then you can, you know, then you can take more risk and you can, you know, potentially have a much larger portfolio. Uh, but the investment dollars that are chasing small business right now, it's a, it's a smaller pond just because of the nature of how quickly the money turns. Money turns. Yeah, you know, the, the consumer side is a kind of a chipping away at the $850 billion iceberg that constitutes revolving balances on credit cards. Um, and the, the chips to date have been pretty small. There's still plenty of um, plenty of excellent creditors that aren't aware that they can get a lower yielding loan uh, and even help retire their debt. But um, I, one of the things that I, I, I'm not as sure of, I, I know that the short term high yield small business loans, which, which is what this panel represents for the most part, I know that that's smaller than 850 billion, but the adjacent spaces I think are actually bigger. So I think when you add in equipment leases and other types of loans, sort of near bank quality loans that will have yields in the 6 to 20 percent range, um, it, to, to some extent of the type that Lending Club has been, uh, has been, you know, has teed up for themselves sure. and that the previous panelists were after. You know, is, are, you, are you all here as a group interested in legging to those adjacent spaces and therefore finding the opportunity to become 10 times as big? We look at it in, in some of our portfolio companies, but again, most of the consumer lending platforms we're involved with, maybe one or two of their products will be those longer duration prime borrowing products. But for the most part, you know, they're high turnover, high frequency type facilities where as the lender, I'm comfortable that even if there's a doomsday tomorrow and we have to take control of the portfolio and wind it down, it's gonna take six to nine months, maybe a year. Tops, and I'd have to see a massive spike in defaults where that average APR doesn't cover not only my principal but my interest payment as well. So we focus more on that. If all of a sudden we are lending to platforms that are lending that money out at three and five and in certain cases seven year paper, well then I'm not just concerned about default risk, I'm concerned about refinancing risk because my capital is not that long. We don't have permanent capital. Right. So we're not looking at that space as much um, but again, that's also why we're not involved with Lending Club and Prosper. Uh, their products don't fit our capital and what our institutional capital wants. And for the most part, you know, anything beyond five years or even six years is way too long. And 
I wouldn't be able to generate the demand from my investors for that sort of duration, so we, we stay clear of it. I mean, I think we're seeking to serve the, the highest number of businesses, small businesses that we can. Uh, I don't know that we've sort of run the table um, on the spaces we're in now before we get to adjacencies. I mean, certainly they would be on our radar as we continue to grow. Um, but uh, when we talk to our small business customers about the alternatives they consider, um, there are a lot of, of other options that they're using. Uh, one of the things we talk about is uh, we talk to business owners about what they've done before, or what they might do instead. They're tapping you know, their friends and family. Uh, and it fits in a bit with the peer-to-peer with the -peer, uh, theme. But if we're able to provide them a better product and a better set of options, uh, we think there's plenty of room to grow in our current space um, before we get into some of those adjacencies. Steve? Yeah, I share most of James's view on that. I mean, the equipment leasing guys, they can go long. They have, they have an asset to protect them. Um, you know, it's a different animal. For us to go out much longer than two years, for people to go out three, four, five years, at least at, at our business, that's a little outside of our core competency right now, and our, certainly our capital structure wouldn't support it. We look at it, but in, in, in the relatively, you know, short to near term, um, we see us staying in, you know, it was 24 months and shorter. Okay. Okay, we're at the five minute mark, so let's take some questions. We cover everything so thoroughly. There is no. Thank you. Thank you, guys. It was an uh, enlightening session for sure. Could you speak uh, to how investors should think about the collections and recovery aspect uh, in the event that borrowers go into default? I can I can talk about that and then and then pass that along. So so um, my fund has been around about 18 months, and in that time we've had a number of we, we have a bad borrowers. About four to five percent of our loans go bad. The process by which the legal recovery happens is very slow. It takes 12 to 18 months. It's done by commission-only attorneys, uh, and it's so lengthy that we've only had two legal recoveries. So what I tell investors is that and, oh and and by the way. It's, it would not be possible to value the loans in the portfolio that are not current at the same rate that you would expect to have legal recoveries against them. Essentially, you value the loans at zero. So what I tell investors is they should expect that the model works with no legal recoveries and that uh, to the extent that there are legal recoveries, that those will be windfalls. So it isn't to say that anyone is particularly wimpy with respect to going after the borrowers that fail to make payments for which we've collected personal guarantees. It's just merely an observation that the, inve that the asset class works even if the collection process doesn't. Doesn't work when you're purchasing whole loans, but for most of our platforms, if something in our pool is in default for 60 to 90 days, it has to be removed from our pool and purchased for par plus accrued or any sort of other payments that are owed by the company off of its balance sheet, which is why we constantly have a 30-day look back to see what that band is on default rates so that we know, one, the company has enough cash on its balance sheet to be able to service this default need, and then two, in the event, again, there's a doomsday, we have the ability to turn it off so that hopefully you know, our historic band and our equity cushion in front of us uh, is enough to keep us protected. But my biggest concern in that regard, and doesn't have any effect here yet, is ACH. In the consumer space, there's been some issues in the past, in the, in the, in the near past, with providers wanting to provide ACH services to certain consumer lenders. Uh, so what we focus on first and foremost with any sort of online lending platform is how many ACH relationships do you have? If this one falls down, who are the two behind it? Uh, because that's our biggest fear. If all of a sudden the, the way of collecting that capital, whether or not that borrower wants to pay it or not, if ACH is out of the question, then it creates uh, some big issues. So that's usually the first question we ask. Okay. We're starting to run down the clock here. Can we get another answer or two on just, that? I would just add to, to, as a distinguishing feature from consumer is the advantage of the daily remit and the fact that we're, we're getting remittances from uh, businesses uh, and, and not just remittances, but also performance data, and that gives us a much better view 
uh, of the performance of the portfolio, and that creates, I think, a lot of, uh, of resiliency to the models uh, at, the, at, at the outset. Uh, and, and so there's just a, a, a different set of advantages in this space operating on a daily remittance platform. Yeah, the, the borrowers really want to repay, and the ones that can't are the ones that, uh, to some extent, that the platforms guess wrong on. You know, I think in many ways, if you, and, and this is how I encourage the platforms I work with to think, is you sh it's better to look at yourself and think about why you made that loan and how you might not have than to sort of blame the borrower. Um, my, the average FICO score of my borrowers is in the 700s. So these are not folks that wanted to get into a situation in which they were going to fail. Okay, I think we're about out of time here. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it.